Okay, so looks like we already have a fair number of people have logged in. We'll give it another minute, let others join us, and then we'll dive in. In the meantime, thanks everybody for joining us. And Got clients from all over logging in and see Colorado, Iowa. Virginia. Maryland. Kind of cool. This digital age, everybody's used to working remotely. So that's kind of neat. It is right, awesome. So, yeah, it has its benefits, you know. I'd say most of our clients, even in the carry office, have just opted to work, vir meet with us virtually, you know, save a 10, 15 minute commute. So um, I've got one after, so why don't we just launch and dive right in? Thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, we've got Clint Sorensen from Wellshield Partners, one of the co founders of Wellshield. So we will give everybody a market and economic update before we dive too far. I want to make sure that everybody has. Uh, liked us, followed us, or subscribed to the YouTube channel and Twitter and Facebook. If you haven't, uh, you know, we will post updates throughout the year. Hopefully you have seen some of that stuff. And the last thing that I want to mention before we dive in is I'm going to once again do the uh, charity bike, rate, bike ride. It's not technically a race. The V Foundation Victory um, Ride for the Cure. So we're building out a team if you have any interest in riding us. And uh, Clint, I know you do the Peloton, so there's actually a, a Peloton version of, of the ride. So you can join our team if you want and ride with us. And yeah, I would love to do that. I'll do the Peloton version for sure. All right, rock, rock on. All right, so uh, we're gonna dive in and, and uh, talk about the State of the Union and markets and updates. And uh, before we go any further, we wanna make sure you see, obviously disclosure, we gotta, gotta, satisfy, gotta satisfy that requirement. But also in the top right, it should be in the top right of your screen, you should see a little uh, panel. And if you hit that orange arrow button, you should be able to see a box that says questions and you'll be able to submit questions to Clint and I. Um, and you can do that at any time and we'll do Q&A. We're gonna try to get to the questions and answer session at about 1245 and then we'll uh, do some questions um, there. So I wanna start with a couple of uh, quotes. Um, you, you probably know Andrew Thrasher, or you know at least of his work. You familiar with his work? Yeah. Yeah, he won the Dow War. Few years back when I was uh, on the board at the CMT. Nice, nice. So I've uh, recently subscribed to his work, um, and this is a quote from him. This is tail end of the year. This is sometime in December when he said this. It's not normal to be less than two percent from a high while the typical stock is down nearly twelve percent. There's hardly anything normal about today's market environment. And Mark Minervini, I would describe the trading in 2021 in two words: no legs. Some stocks made nice moves but this is probably the most bifurcated market I've seen in 38 years of trading. Again, that comment was made towards the end of December. And Kathy Wood, arguably, um, how would you describe Kathy? She's one of the, um, I don't know, she's very she's successful. She's, yeah, yeah, I mean, one of the best growth investors of our time, really. It's amazing how well she's yep. done. Yep, she's done amazing, but in, in her words, I've never been in a market that is up and our strategies are down. And then this is a friend of mine. I don't know if you know Adam. 2021 was a year where the largest mega cap stocks made investing look like it should have been easy. And the vast majority of uh, investors' truths were completely different than reality. So kind of what happened. So um, S&P was up, what, 27, 28%? Yeah, 28%. So that was, everything was up 27, 28%, right? No. <laughs> you should think, right? Well, that's what everybody thinks, but you know, unfortunately, nobody remembers, or it's so hard for the average investor to remember the S and P 500 is cap weighted, and so what was it 40 percent of the return was from like 25 percent of the stocks? In, yeah, uh, and actually, yeah, and if you take out, if you go back to pre-pandemic, right, 
if you take out the top five names, which make up a little over almost 25 percent, it varies between 22 to 25 percent. But uh, if you take out those top five names, right, Facebook, Apple, Alphabet, Microsoft and uh, Amazon. So the three A's, right? You take those. Uh, if you take those names out, you essentially return zero. Yeah. Right. Up until the end of the year. But with those names, you did 30 percent from pre-pandemic to the highs of uh, right prior to or through the end of the year last year. So it's really amazing how that market cap uh, weighting changes the game. Yeah. So uh, we're going to show a slide in a couple of minutes on on uh, how that affected the NASDAQ. But this is the NASDAQ index, again, up 20 percent. You can see a couple minor corrections throughout the years, 10, 8, 7 and 5 percent corrections. But again, that was not what the average NASDAQ stock experienced. Then this is the small cap index. Small caps were, um, you know, they had a high what, in March and they were in this channel. They just moved sideways all year long finally broke out in november and we thought hey the bulls are, are raging man we're gonna be no it, that rally failed and small caps have have struggled this is bonds this is uh, the aggregate bond index that's the safe asset class isn't it clint supposedly right but i'm not sure what's safe anymore right so the uh aggregate bond etf was down three percent last year that's price only that doesn't count any yield um and uh, this is an interna international ETF that I watch, up 6%. So definitely not, everything was not up 27%. So I wanna talk a little bit about breadth. You know, I've always explained breadth by the, uh, the analogy, the generals and the soldiers, right? You know, so if the generals are advancing and the soldiers aren't, that's probably not a military objective that's gonna be successful. Well, the last time I said that one of my, um, Marine clients sent me a message and said, Ted, the generals never advance. It's always the captains and lieutenants. Oh, okay. So if the captains <laughs> and the lieutenants are advancing and the soldiers don't, that's not gonna, it's not gonna work well. And so here's a, a measure. I've got three different measures on the screen, but let's really focus on that 200 day moving average. Would you explain what, how, how would you explain the 200 day moving average or the simple moving average to folks? Yeah, it's uh, essentially it's a way of smoothing out the price return, right? So if you're looking at the prices and how they go up, you're looking at a 200 day average of that. Um, and you're just trying to say, hey, is the general trend up or down? So if that, you know, the way you look at it technically is if that trend's moving up, right, then that's a positive trend. If that moving average is moving down, that's a negative trend. Some people measure it by price above or price below. It's a little faster, but prices above will pull the moving average up prices below will move the moving average down. So it's just taking the last 200 days and a price return or of market action and showing you kind of how that's, you know, how that's looking, right? From a from a zoom out view. And that's why, you know, it's a good measure, a good measure of broad market trend, long-term market trend. Yeah, and so the 200 days is what? Approximately nine months. So in the stock market, we've got 252 trading days, plus or minus in the, in the yep, year. So 200 days is about nine months. So that's why we generally say that's the long-term indicator or the long-term yep. trend. If the stock's above it, we're in an uptrend. If the stock's below it, we're in a downtrend. And so in April, the uh, S&P 500 had about 96% of that um, index was above the 200-day line, which means 96% of the S&P 500 in April was in a uptrend. But ever since that, it just got worse and worse and worse. Meanwhile, the S&P 500 kept going up. And so that's the, the divergence that we'll see. And then we'll look at the same measure. This is the NASDAQ. NASDAQ was even worse. The peak on the breadth measure in NASDAQ was, what does that say, January 25th? And then ever since, all throughout the year, more and more stocks in that NASDAQ. And the NASDAQ has got, what, 2,300 stocks in it, something like that? That's right. So it's a broader measure so you really look at that it's saying that more and more stocks are really struggled throughout 2021 and then this is the same measurement on the new york stock exchange um, so not a lot of stocks had a good year and again this is the same thing so it's just a, showing a divergence you've got the s p 500 on the bottom that's showing that it's, it's advancing and that breadth measure um, going down all year long so then we were talking about this, you move the top stocks in the S&P 500. So there's your NASDAQ, right? Well, what does it look like if we remove the top five stocks in the NASDAQ? 
it's extremely negative. It's so, amazing. It was amazing. Uh, it was also very frustrating because you, we get clients that are saying, well, you know, if market's doing this, why am I not doing that? And it's, that's the answer. Everybody's not participating in this game. Um, same information here. We don't need to spend a ton of time on it. It's just not everybody's participating in that rally. And you know what's so funny is a lot of people think they want market cap weighting, but historically that's a terrible way to weight any kind of system, right? If I if I went to you and I said, here's my trading strategy, I'm going to buy the biggest companies, right? The companies with the most market cap, right? And I'm going to weight those the heaviest in the portfolio. If you look historically, that has been a terrible idea. I mean, think back to 2007, perfect example. Biggest company was ExxonMobil, right? Energy and financials were over 40% of the all country world index. I think they're 42% or something like that. By the end of 2000 and, or by the uh, middle of 2009, they were 17%. So think about that change. And then, and now you have healthcare and tech that dominate that market cap weighting space. And you're starting to see that mean reversion a bit. And I don't know if this is the beginning or the end, right? I mean, that's the, that's the great thing about markets and the fun thing about this game. But at the end of the day, when you look at that, that's pretty profound. That switch has been pretty profound, and we're right back there. So it's never a really good long-term strategy, but we, we, you know, that's what we compare ourselves to, and that's that's the curse of the relative performance game. I think it, it doesn't, uh, it's not applicable to any individual situation, and because it's so prevalent in the media, and that's what a lot of people benchmark to, they think that's what they have to get, but that's a curse. the The goal should be absolute returns. How much can I compound my money at the least amount of risk? And do that over a long period of time and i know that i'm going to hit financial goals right that's that's simplistic but that's the way we should view it but unfortunately we've been kind of pulled into this competitive relative performance game and not a not a fun environment no no so let's talk about inflation you know inflation is something we've been talking about uh for the better part of a year uh federal reserve kept using the term transitory and we're like i don't know that we really agree with that term um, and so at the end of the year, like 7% inflation is the highest it's been since 1982. Um, and we're going to spend a lot of time on this. But the the main thing that I want to try to get across initially is this. I saw this on the Asian Times, the worst U.S. inflation since 1982. It's a huge understatement or underestimate. And it's part of it. I'd love to, to get you to talk a little bit about this, Clint. Um, you know, the CPI uses owner equivalent rent. Yeah. So Ted, what would you rent your house to me for? Without knowledge of what rents are going for, I'm going to ask you in a survey what you'd rent your house to me for. You answer that question, that's what owner-occupied rent is. It's completely absurd, um, especially when you look at Case or Home Price Index or any kind of national home price index. You know, you've got owner-occupied rents, which are a, roughly a third of the CPI calculation. And if you inserted home prices you're almost i mean you're you're going up at least 50 percent in terms of that heavy number yeah it's so a friend of amazing a friend of mine is an economist and um he and i have chatted over the years about gross domestic product or gdp versus gross output and i he and i agree we both like gross output as opposed to gdp but you know we've been using the gdp stats since like 1940 or 42 or something like that we're probably not going to get that toothpaste back in the tube. And so we're because we've always used GDP, we're always going to reference it. Same thing here. I mean, this is a horrible uh, metric, but are they ever going to, to change it? And it gets worse because this is, I learned this a couple of years ago that they're making what do they call it hedonic adjustments uh, to the <laughs> CPI. It's absolutely insane what they're doing. Um, and we don't need to spend a ton of time on it, but the reality is, the CPI up 7%, it's not reality. It's worse than that. Um, well, what's and, the thing about statistics, right? There's lies, I'm not gonna say the other word, and then statistics, right? right. That's right, that's right. So, you know, here's some some uh, data points. We got energy up 48, almost 49, 50%. Um, and I love this. This is, I, I was looking at this slide. This is Econ 101, look at this, new vehicles, we're up about 12% last year, you know, but we had a supply chain problem. We still do. 
So you can't find new vehicles. And so what happens is all that demand got pushed over into the used car markets and the used car prices went up 37%, which is why we have only two vehicles in a three car household. I just can't pull myself to buy a third vehicle just to allow Savannah to drive uh, whenever she wants. So this is supply chain. This is a chart, the, the wisdom of Twitter, right? There's actually a lot of wisdom. There's a lot of, it's a cesspool out there but there is a lot of good stuff that you can get on Twitter as well. And I came across this from a friend of mine. This is the container ships um, in port. It is not going down. We, we really think the uh, supply chain problem is gonna get fixed. And I was reading an article the other day about this, that it's, um, it's not, you can't work 24 hours um, to get that fixed. It's going to take a long time for the container ship problem to um, to get rectified. And again, it's just been getting worse and worse and worse. So let's talk a little bit about the uh, leading economic indicators. I know this is a slide you particularly like. So walk yeah, us through this. Let's I'm going to step back and tackle inflation a little bit too, because I think in the, the uh, leading economic indicators matter in that conversation, right? Because when you talk about growth, inflation, and policy, Right. Or when you talk about growth and then policy, you have to talk about inflation. So we call yes. it our growth, inflation, and policy model. It's super important to understanding what the Fed's going to do, right? So if growth and inflation are both accelerating, Fed typically tightens. When growth's slowing, inflation's rising, Fed's in a box. Or when inflation's persistently high, growth and inflation rallying together, Fed's or uh, growth rising, inflation falling, Fed's like, okay, let's let things go, right? That's a great economic environment. It's called disinflation. And then lastly, of growth and inflation falling together, which is what we call deflation. And, you know, that's what everyone's so scared of. Uh, secularly, is deflation. You have a lot of negative market events and that type of activity. It's good for consumers because prices come down, but it's, it's pretty problematic uh, as it relates to the broader economic environment. Well, when you think about inflation, there's something the Fed's going to, and they're saying they're going to try to fight inflation, right? We're, we're hearing that they're going to take this hard stance because it's not transitory, et cetera. But what we find is that this inflation is it's not what the Fed has historically dealt with and can control. The supply chain issues, number one, those container ships, right? Uh, the pent up demand, but there's this huge supply problem. And there's a lot of spending that we have uh, believed has been growth. That spending does not equal growth. Spending is a, a temporary elixir, right? Uh, to certain pains that, you know, are dealt with in difficult ways like austerity and things that we, we just don't choose to deal with them that way, right? We choose to just spend more money and we mistake that spending for growth. Well, problematic, this is now a global phenomenon and it is amazing. So there's 6.9 trillion by certain estimates of global spending on green projects through the year of 2050, but 2030 is the zero net carbon neutral kind of target. Think about that, 6.9 trillion. And what do they require? It requires raw metal. It requires you know, raw materials. It requires metals. It requires a lot of things that have this unnecessary, or not necessarily unnecessary, but this unprecedented amount of spending behind. So this demand that's created by governments, right? Huge. I mean, you're talking over $500 trillion. Like, it's amazing. It's, Every time I say the number, it just sounds foolish. My problem, yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. Now you have that going through 2030. You also couple that with a supply problem. We don't have enough raw metals uh, or base metals. We don't mine enough. It takes five to 10 years, according to Freeport McMoran CEO, to get a copper mine online. Five to 10 years to get production. You simply don't make enough of this stuff. So when you pair that, and then you read Larry Fink's ideas when he says, yes, to get to zero, net neutral on carbon, we're gonna to have to tolerate some inflation. What we have is we have an environment where it's really spending and supply-based inflation. That's not necessarily something the Fed can really do. It's not a cost of capital issue. So raising interest rates, right, to slow the economy doesn't necessarily challenge this type of inflation. So we're in a big, big pickle. And at that at that time, the Fed's saying, "Hey, we're gonna we're gonna combat this inflation we're looking at, right? Which is high, you know, the highest since 1982. And again, using house prices, you're probably looking at closer to 12 percent, and hasn't started slowing yet. Through the fourth quarter, we just got data through December, hadn't slowed. It's continued to make new highs, right? And then we've got all this raw material price pressure. You're thinking, how? I, I don't. It's hard to make the case 
for this really abating. Now, I can make the case for it slowing. Maybe it goes from 7.4 to 5, or I don't know, right, by the end of the year, because just a rate of change base effects, but that's still persistently high. And that's going to be a very difficult box for the Fed to manage out of. And go to the next slide, or the uh, economic growth slide. Here's why it's going to be so difficult. So a moment ago, I said when growth is slowing and inflation's rising, right, what most people would call stagflation, the Fed's in a box. And the box is uh, very simply defined. If they tighten, they hammer the economy. If they ease, they create more inflation, right? Because that, you know, again, again money, more money printing creates, hypothetically, uh, more inflation, all else being equal, right? So when you assume that, and then you look at this chart, I'm our economic growth has already started to slow. It started to slow in the second quarter of last year. Leading indicators peaked and have been slowing since then. You can see they're below the six-month moving average, like the 200-day, right? The six-month moving average is now pointed downward. And the odds favor that this actually moves negative by the second quarter of this year. So the worst time we're going to have growth-wise is right when the Fed's hiking rates. Right. <laughs> it's a very difficult environment. So they're going to have to be really careful, uh, right? They're going to pay attention to the market environment, but they're going to have to be very careful about how they manage that. Because if they're saying, hey, out of one side, behind door number one, we're going to fight inflation, and this is going to be very Volcker-esque, and we're going to hammer the economy, and they still can't fight inflation because there's all this spending and pent-up demand and supply chain issues that create that inflation right now. But they're going to try to ha they're going to hammer the economy to try to stop that, and they're not successful. Their credibility is going to be out the window. And then on the flip side, if the market reaction to a negative growth event and a tightening Fed is more than they can handle, right? And they they turn back to say, hey, we're not going to tighten four times. We're going to tighten twice or we're going to stop tightening. We're not going to stop buying bonds or whatever they do to, to kind of communicate easing. Well, then they shake their credibility that they really can't control inflation. So it is I'm just glad I'm not Jerome Powell. They have the hardest the, the Fed and the Board of Governors have the hardest job that's ever faced them up until this point, in my opinion. Yeah, so over the Christmas holiday, I read Volcker's book, and um, I was asking uh, another economist yesterday, because I seem to remember in reading his book that Volcker and the Federal Reserve, they tightened interest rates, or they raised interest rates, and they did it like the following week. I mean, they were <laughs> incredibly aggressive, and it took a while for it to really, and I've, remember reading them many years ago that when they raise interest rates, it takes about nine months for that to affect to really fully go through the economy. So there's many, I, I, I think you and I are on the same page, they're behind the curve and they're really gotten themselves into pickle. And I, again, tell me what you think, but it seems to me like they've been forecasting 25 basis points increases. And it's like, that's not enough, but then it's going to lead to these other problems. So it's, it's very concerning. Yeah, you know, they're a dog that's caught its tail, right? Yep. So I've got a I've got a uh, Australian Labradoodle and she'll chase her tail. If I grab her tail, she'll chase it. When she catches it, she'll just run around in circles. That's the Fed, right? The, the Fed is uh, essentially they govern, they control almost 100% now the business cycle, right? When they, when they ease, we mistake their spending and their stimulus and everything because asset prices rise as growth, right? And it comes through the real economy in a very... Uh, diminished way. So the marginal revenue product of debt is the way you measure that. So essentially for every dollar spent, you're getting about 28 cents on the dollar in growth, right? So, and that's come down substantially since that, that measure has been out since I think the late 50s. So since about 58, that's come down from almost one to one to now it's about 0.28 to 0.3, depending on the measure. So when you think about that, diminishing marginal returns back to economics 101 uh, that you feature on the inflation slide, they have to get bigger and bigger in the amount of stimulus to get the same effect, right, that they desire in the wealth effect and in the markets. Well, so when they ease, they create this growth pattern. And then when it gets out of hand, they're like, okay, we're going to we're gonna start tightening again because maybe we can come off zero and start tightening. But guess what happens? They can't tighten too far without hammering the, the economy because they control it. <laughs> so the moment they pull out the punch bowl, the economy, the growth, which is really spending and asset price inflation reverses. And so then they have to go back to easing. So they keep, uh, if you look at interest rates, the perfect way to look at it, right? The Fed funds rate, it keeps going to a lower high, then a lower low, lower high. They, they just don't have the ability to tighten much. And so I think 
this is going to be the real challenge to them. Um, I don't know how it plays out, but it's going to be really important to watch because I think this is probably, again, like I said, the, the hardest time to be a Federal Reserve governor uh, since the 80s. And I think it's even more difficult now because we didn't have this amount of dependency on stimulus and, yeah. and quantitative easing. Yeah. So one of the um, economists that I follow, um, you know, we, we the natural question of everything that we, you and I were just talking about is, well, are we going to see a recession? And I'm starting to see more and more economists say, yeah, it's entirely possible. It's 25% um, chance that we see uh, a recession. And you know, I won't be surprised if that if other economists are putting that higher. Um, so if they if they hammer if they go out after inflation and they tighten four more times, uh, you most likely you will have. Uh, it's hard to pinpoint exactly when the National Bureau of Economic Research will denote a recession because it's actually uh, not defined as two consecutive quarters of negative GDP. It's defined by essentially a, a pervasive decline in personal incomes, uh, industrial production, average hourly or not average hourly earnings, but average um, pay like payroll growth, non-farm payroll growth, and then I forget the fourth. Uh, but it's essentially, or retail sales, retail sales, the fourth. So they look at those four big things, right? And they're looking at those and how they trend, essentially. Yeah. And then this this committee denotes whether you're in a recession or not. So it's hard in you know your seat or my seat to figure out when we're going to have a recession, uh, or to be an economist and and make you know it's like a weatherman, right? Are we going to have three inches of snow or ice? And so what I think the most important thing to do is look at this chart, right? And this chart tells you where we are. And so what you look at is you can see trend growth, that line that kind of goes up around the top. That's your kind of base measure of where we are. Contraction is when growth is slowing. So it's when growth, like those leading indicators we showed previously, are declining, but they're doing that in an environment that's below trend growth. So that is what a contraction is. And that's what we saw in 2020. We actually saw it in 2016. We saw it again, in, uh, I think it was 2012, 2011, 2012. Uh, we saw it in uh, briefly in 2011 coming out of the, so we've had multiple contractions. And I think that's more important to measure than necessarily waiting on the NBR to say, hey, this is an actual right. recession. Because they, by the time they announced it, like in 2000, they announced it, I think in September of 2001, we were already out. Uh, right. <laughs> they said, hey, recession happened in March. And by the time they announced it, we were literally out of the recession. So you know, it's it, waiting on that doesn't really help you in terms of how, how to position portfolios or make decisions exactly. as a relation to business. So I try to use this chart and just say, hey, where are we relative to trend growth? So trend growth is called 2%. Are we above 2% annualized and or are we below it? And then are we slowing or accelerating? And really, if all you get is that slowing or accelerating piece, that tends to give you all the information you need. So right now we're in that slowdown phase, right? We're above trend growth, but slowing. Um, if the Fed continues their tightening path, the odds favor will dip quickly below trend. And so, yeah, I can echo the fact that by my definition of a contraction or recession will be there by the end of 2023 if the Fed continues on its path. Um, you know, hopefully that doesn't happen, but, you know, we have to be prepared for that eventuality. So I think also when you go back and you think about the 70s and Volcker and Reagan and um, that type of thing, you know, um, my understanding is when, when, when they were trying to tackle inflation, Volcker knew if he tightened the, tightened the economy and raised interest rates, everybody's going to hate him. And yeah. from what I've been told, I, you know, reliable sources, Reagan's like, I, we got your back. Don't worry about it. Do what you need to do. We got to fight this. We got to. So they knew a recession. We knew we know we're going to cause a recession if we do it, but we have to do it. And they did. Yeah. So the question yeah. is, are they going to be bold enough? And does the Federal Reserve have um, the credibility? And do they have the support of the White House? And can they even do it, right? Like that's the thing that worries me when you have this global spending. It's a tough, it's a tough thing. It's a, it's a, it's new, right? It's a new question. It's a new uh, paradigm, if you will. We haven't had this amount of global coordinated spending on things that are going to really deplete raw material price or raw material supplies and increase prices theoretically. So yeah. it's going to be interesting to watch for sure. Yeah. So this is, a, let's spend a couple of slides on fixed income because, you know, we have a lot of clients that, that span um, the, the the traditional risk spectrum. And this has been a conversation we've been having with a lot of them, especially the ones on the 
lower end of you know the conservative clients, um, you know we have to we try to remind everybody that fixed income um, that it's inversely related to the interest rates. And so as interest rates are going down, the bond prices are going up. Well, you know we've really been in a 40 year long bull market for bonds, and that's caused um, that's causing some concern because you know you and I both know, and so does everybody else. It's a certainty that interest rates are going to rise. The question is going to be how aggressive are they going to be? How long is that trend? And I don't think you are, neither of us are forecasting that they're going to raise rates to what they were back in the 70s, but they got to move higher than where they're at. And when that happens, it's going to be a, a tough environment for um, fixed income. And one of the things that we always talk about, or we've always been taught, is that when we diversify a client's portfolio, that diversification is, is helping. Right, because when the stock market's volatile, well, if you got bonds in your portfolio, you know that's that's your shock absorber. So this is only one week, but that was the first week of this year. Uh, you got the green line is uh, the S and P 500, and the blue line is seven to ten year Treasuries. I mean, they're both down two percent in a single week. Where's the diversification? Where's the benefit of diversification? So, um, and then here's another example, the safety of bonds, right? This is a global or an international bond and it gapped down 3% at the open on December 23rd. That's yeah, safe, it's not, right? It's not, it's not a safe investment, right? No. All right. Um, so just another way to look at the same thing. We got three different measures. Uh, you got uh, one to three year treasuries at the top. You got the aggregate bond we actually already showed. And then the 20 year bonds down 6% last year, very volatile ride for the 20 years. So um, I loved his book, but I can't say his name. How do you say that guy's name? Antonio. Uh, I, I, anyway, well, I read yeah. his book. Oh, I'm gonna, yeah. Yeah, it's a great book. Yeah. And th saying the same thing, bonds had negative real returns from 1940 all the way through 1981. Um, during the 7 and 8 crisis, bonds held up relatively well, but stocks and bonds have been positively correlated, meaning they do the same thing. Stocks and bonds have been positively correlated nearly 70% of the time since 1973. And then I love this one. Since 1900, the maximum drawdown, in other words, peak to trough, maximum draw, drawdown in long-term U.S. government bonds was 68%, while the maximum drawdown for stocks was 73. That's not what people are used to thinking about. No, they're and tied to the same thing. They're tied to interest rates, right? Yes. They're tied to cost of capital. And you know we talk about the recency bias, like so all of our clients and most of the people in, in the industry, we've got recency bias. There's not many people that were, you know, actively managing money for other people in you know the 70s. Right. We haven't experienced it. So what do you do? Well, you you got to study something other than just what what's happening recently. And, and I'm not going to go through all this other than to quote Warren Buffett. Granted, this was in the 2012 annual letter, but Warren Buffett. They are among the most dangerous of assets. He's talking about bonds. Over the past century, these instruments have destroyed the purchasing power of investors in many countries, even as the holders continue to receive timely payments of interest and principal. Right now, bonds should come with a warning label. And if you look back at 2012, a very similar environment to where we're at today, which is why uh, we're going to talk a little bit about different ways that we need to uh, manage risk. So again, this is now year to date. So the S&P 500 is down. This is as of yesterday. The S&P is down about 10% year to date. NASDAQ down about 17%. And uh, that quote from Bespoke Investments is a little outdated because it's uh, from a week or two ago. But that is uh, just showing you how bad January is in compared to um, the rest of those uh, time periods. And then Bitcoin. Should we, should we park on Bitcoin for a while or just highlight that Bitcoin's not the answer? And it's some of this, I think, is also just the point that you and I try to make. It's not buy and hold. You can't buy something like this and hold it and assume it's going to work. That, that's exactly right. And I, I really feel bad for a lot of the people who have fallen victim to this whole store value theory in Bitcoin. And look, I like I like Bitcoin. I love new assets. I actually love the volatility. I think it's a great instrument for for trading, for trading, for having an investment discipline, for buying and selling it. It makes a lot of sense, right? But it's a commodity. It is a, it's defined as a commodity by the CFTC. It is a commodity, not a currency. 
or a store of value. It's a commodity. And so it's like storing your value in corn. That, that doesn't mean, you know, I want to, I want to buy and sell. I want to trend. I want to follow the trend. I want to have a system for making these yeah. decisions that uh, don't involve buying something just for the sake of a theory. And I think I feel really bad for a lot of people who feel victim to that because I think Bitcoin's a great component of a portfolio, but you have to have a system for trading it. Yeah. So um, we have a client, I think she's about 72. Um, last time I met with this particular client, um, she said, Ted, should I have Bitcoin in my portfolio? And I said, the fact that you're asking me about that tells me the answer is no. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, um, and we can also use this as a, uh, as a point sometimes, and I forgot to include a chart on this, but gold. If we're talking about high inflationary environment, gold is a store of value. Gold beats inflation, et cetera, et cetera. Well, one of the academic papers I read in December was uh, written by a researcher. I think he's at Duke, if memory serves. I think it was uh, Dr. Campbell, if you're familiar with him. Oh, yeah. But yeah, he was talking, great. say again? He's great. Yeah. So he's talking about how if we, in order to assess whether or not gold is a good uh, asset value or asset class in high inflationary environments, you have to first define high inflation. And so um, they defined it by 5% inflation and persisting above 5% or 5% or higher for six months. He said, when you look at it that way, there's only about five periods in US history. And out of those, or I'm sorry, eight periods, there's eight periods in the United States history that fits that definition of high inflation. Out of that eight time periods, gold outperformed only once. So- Gold's and, a growth asset. It's right. not in high inflation. And that's what most people don't realize. It's when real yields are falling, right? That growth is a good asset. And and I, I you know, Ted, I probably answer this question more than any other question about any other asset because people say, oh, there's inflation high. Why is gold struggling like last year? And I'm like, well, gold struggling because it's a growth slowing asset. So we had growth accelerating to the second quarter, right? And you had inflation accelerating at the same time. And if you look at that. Yeah, gold historically does okay, but it's not the top performing asset. It's not a store of value by any means in an inflationary regime. It really works in a stagflationary regime or a deflationary regime. So both of those, the commonality is growth is decelerating. It's slowing. Yeah. And so that's what that's where gold, quote unquote, shines is uh, when growth is not doing too well. Yeah, so Athea sent me a message to tell us to, to speed up. So let's talk a little bit about midterm elections and um, what this looks like for 2022, because that's really the reason why folks are dialing into a webinar like this. Um, the, the black line is showing us all midterm election years. The blue line is, show, I'm sorry, the black line is all years. The blue line is all midterm years. And you can see what it's showing us is, you know, a, a somewhat drifting north and then down to sideways and then once the elections behind us it begins to to trend up um what do you think of that yeah you know i think um you know I I'm, I'm seasonal patterns i tend to be pretty careful on right um because yeah. you know it's really sample size and neglect a lot of times uh, sure. But I think it's very informative and they can be e extremely helpful into looking at the general trend of all the periods where there are midterm elections. And you can say, OK, we got some choppiness ahead. Right. And then I fit that to where we are today from a business cycle standpoint. And when you look at the business cycle environment, the pressure the Fed's under, then you start coupling that with political pressure. So let's go back to our door one and two scenario. Fed tightens. Right, tries to really fight inflation to hammer the economy. That's not good for uh, you know for the current administration heading into a midterm election. Then vice versa. Let's say they even try to do that and they can't fight inflation. Or door number two, they pivot to rescue the market and the inflation continues to stay elevated. That's not good for the current administration because it's really a uh, you know consumers treat that as a taxation. It really and you saw it in consumer confidence. One chart. Uh, that I forgot to actually send you, I should have sent you, but last year, consumer confidence took a nosedive. Got just, uh, I mean, it was below, uh, at the end of the year, the levels that it was during the bottom of the pandemic, consumer confidence. That right. is inflation related and consumer confidence is, you know, obviously shows up in the polls. And so I think, I think that the, where we are from a business cycle environment, means that the midterm elections are something to watch and something that I'm, I'm sure the current administration is pretty panicked about at this moment. Yeah. 
So um, let's keep moving. I'm going to skip these next two slides because these are deep in the weeds and we're going to run out of time. Um, all right, so let's begin shifting a little bit and talk a little bit about, okay, so to some extent, what I want to say before we move on is I should, we show the slide about what happens in midterm election years, not to make a prediction. We're not predicting that's what's going to happen, but we're trying to show you, well, historically, again, I agree with you, Clint, there's a lot of bias in that because we don't have a lot of enough history to make good statistical decisions, plus information is always changing. And if there is a January effect, by the time everybody figures it out, no longer works. Um, but we have to talk about little, what are we doing? And so clients that have been with us for a long time know that I have created what I call my VSI because I'm obviously an aviation nut. You can see at least three airplanes in my background. Um, the VSI stands for vertical speed indicator. And it's really just a composite indicator that takes 14 different indicators and rolls it up so that we can look at the kind of the weight of the evidence. Um, and the idea of this is that if you hear the tornado siren blasting, what do you do? You, you, you go in to seek shelter. You go into the basement and, and you move to safety. Well, this is not predictive. What we're not, we're not trying to say, well, because this is on a, on a cell signal, then it's going to mean it's, that's not what it's telling us. It just means the conditions are right, that we might want to seek some safety. Um, well, if I, and the VSI, I only measure that once a month. I look at it frequently, but I only take an official measurement of once a month. And if I measure it today, it's firmly on a cell signal. Okay. And this is going to be driving one of the, the sleeves that we use for our, our clients. Um, the bottom line is risk is the possibility of losing money. And so one of the things that we are sensitive to, as we've already discussed, is the fact that Traditionally, we've always been taught that, hey, the way that you um, manage risk in a portfolio is you increase allocation to bonds. Well, if we know we're in a rise in interest rate environment and we know last year bonds struggled, there's a reasonable conclusion that bonds are really going to continue to struggle. So do we really want to be very heavy in bonds? Um, so we're looking at new ways to manage money or not necessarily new ways to manage money, but new ways to manage that risk is the reality is as the team has grown, we have even more ability to be active in a client's portfolio. And so it's like, it goes back to that gold, that question about gold or Bitcoin or anything like that. It's not that these asset classes are bad, but if they're not doing what we want them to do, I don't want to, I don't want them right now. You know? So do you like Bitcoin? Yes. But do you want it right now? I don't want it right now. Right. Uh, and you can take Bitcoin out of that sentence and put anything else in it. And so one of the things that we're looking at is trying to diversify um, the timing or the time frame diversification as well as the system diversification. So we really have four different sleeves that we're operating now for, for clients and each of them are running off of different sleeves and different time periods because nothing that we're gonna do is going to absolutely protect us or absolutely gonna guarantee that the markets are gonna be up or down or we have no idea. But we're trying to manage risk by um, diversifying our signals, diversify our sleeves, and some of it, we're going to ride out market volatility. Some of it, when market volatility happens, we're just going to, you know, go back into that basement. So um, let me pull up for a second. Does that, am I describing that accurately? Do you, do you think I need to color anything with that? No, I mean, I can't, I can't share that sentiment more. Um, and here's, here's why. And regime changes, outliers tend to cluster right and so having everybody thinks diversify by asset class like you mentioned but that's based on flawed academic theory that we yeah. now that wall street has used to to manage portfolios because it keeps money invested and they earn their fees unfortunately risk is not standard deviation the variance around some average right historical average that makes absolutely no sense i want all the upside volatility i can possibly have none of them down right uh, that's exactly. cool. And so when you look at that, you have to diversify by process or system. You have to diversify by time period because you, as you mentioned in your comments about the prediction of the midterm elections, you, we can't predict. All we can do is react and diversify the, 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 uh, the signals, right, under why we react. And I read something recently. It was called, it was by, on a book by Tom Basso and Michael Cavell called Trend Following Mindsets. Relatively new, good book. I read and it. 
Yeah, and what he what Tom Bass was talking about was like he, one of his systems was 37% accurate. And that was a good system, right? So we've got a, a good risk management system is going to be, we, we have to assume somewhere between 30 to 50% accurate. And that's okay. And right. that, is, but we know that that will do the job of protecting portfolios. And so by diversifying in different systems, different processes, and over time frames, we just increase our odds of, of providing a smoother ride. And so I can't, I, I can't share or echo that sentiment more. I think that is exactly what you do in a regime shift. And arguably, we are in the middle of an epic regime shift as it relates to inflation. And, um, you know, this allows you to, to capture opportunities and avoid major pitfalls. Yeah, yeah. All right. Appreciate that. So we're going to uh, pull up here in just a second and, and start taking some questions. We've already got some questions that are coming in. Uh, remember, everybody, on the right-hand side of your screen, you should see a little orange arrow. If you click that arrow, you'll have a pop out and you'll be able to ask a, a question. So first question came in actually just a couple minutes into the webinar, but we can go ahead and answer it because I think we've already uh, talked a little bit about this with the last with the uh, uh, last quarter of 2021 showing significant growing economy with around 6% economic growth for the year. Why are investments doing so poorly? I think the reality of that is it's just that the bifurcation in the market that the vast majority of stocks and the vast majority were not performing well. It was just the handful of stocks that are um, overweighting the S&P 500. Um, that's, that's reality. And all of these, the NASDAQ, both the S&P and the NASDAQ, they're both cap weighted, right? Yeah, that's right. And if you look back at your chart, you showed how uh, these internal measures, measures of internal strength, percentage of stocks above the 200-day moving average in any of the index, guess when they, when they peaked? They yeah. peaked coincident with the economic cycle. So yeah, growth on an absolute basis looks good, the, the headline number, but think what we've come down from. So on a year-over-year -year basis, nominal GDP peaked out in the second quarter at 16.7%. By the end of the year, it was up 6%. Think about that. that. That's when we were talking about the rate of change, the fall, the deceleration in growth, that number reflects a major deceleration in growth. If I went out to you and I said, growth's gonna get cut by more than in half, and I told institutional investors and people we advise, they would flee. They would run for the hills. And when you couple that, right, that deceleration in growth, so slowdown in growth starting in the second quarter last year, you see that in the market internals. What you didn't see was the rotation out of the big major major mega cap names that that you're referring to. And I think that that is, uh, you know, the, the the signs were there and it was there in the breadth. And that's why the, the market returns don't reflect the absolute value of growth. They reflect the direction of growth more so the the slope. Yeah, I'm, I'm smiling because I see the next question is based on these reports, shouldn't we all be investing in the top five stocks? Um, classic, classic question. And the, the reality is the way that we are investing clients' assets is we, we want those things that are performing well to be in the portfolio. So we were, we were in one of the positions that we were in was a growth ETF that generated great returns within the, the portfolio. But the reality is we're not going to put everything in something like that. We are going to be, quote unquote, diversified. We're just being um, careful about how we're being diversified, if that makes sense. Yeah, and it goes back to that relative versus absolute return um, measurement, right? The relative curse would say, yeah, in hindsight, I should be in those five names. But when you look historically, that's not a very robust way to manage money and actually it leads to ruin often. So you've got to you've got to really say, hey, what do I need to earn? What do I need to compound at based on the risk that I'm willing to handle, and just stay true and disciplined to that system. Yeah. Um, so s seems like somebody has their hand raised. We can't call on you because there's um, because of the webinar, we can't hear your audio. So just submit a question via the question tab, and those those are popping through. I don't know if you're seeing the questions, but I got the questions right here. Um, so the Fed said it would probably be raising interest rates starting in March. Why is the Fed waiting so long to act given the inflation problem? Yeah, they want to. They want to. They don't want to hammer the economy. Um, so you know, they know. They know what happens. You know, they're they these these people are very intelligent. They look at the same things we're looking at. 
they're seeing the yield curve flatten. They're looking at every all the signs that suggest that we're going to have a pretty nasty slowdown if they if they tighten. So they're talking about a quarter point in March, four hikes over the course of the year. Uh, they're trying to buy themselves time to hopefully have inflation moderate towards the end of the year, which it's scheduled to do, right? If I'm if I'm looking at just math, the base year over year percentage change. Let's say inflation peaked in December, then by next by this December. I should hopefully have a negative year over year, or at least a lot, a, a lot more reduced year over year number when I'm looking at annual inflation rates. And so they're kind of trying to buy themselves some time. Uh, unfortunately, I just think with all these spending and all the spending phenomenon behind it, I don't know if it's going to work. Uh, I hope for their sake and for the market's sake and uh, for everyone's sake that that is the case, but we can't bet on that. That is, hope is not an investment strategy. But yeah, yeah. that's that's what they're trying to do is buy themselves some time. Yeah, so one of the things I've been telling clients is I, you know, if you go back and you think about Greenspan, Greenspan would give a testimony to Congress and it sounded um, very, very intelligent. And when you go back and you actually read it, he actually didn't say anything. Um, and the, the Chairman Powell, Janet Yellen, Bernanke, I think they've done a pretty good job of foreshadowing what they're going to do. Um, the way that I describe this is I, I tell my kids, you know, my son, Teddy is eight. All right, son, 30 minutes till bedtime. All right, son, 15 minutes to bedtime. All right, son, five minutes to bedtime. Hey, son, it's bedtime. And the idea being that he's not going to give me a meltdown when it's actually bedtime. By the way, it doesn't work. Um, but <laughs> with, with Chairman Powell and the Federal Reserve, I like the fact that they're foreshadowing what they're going to do so that when they actually do it in March, the market's not going to go crazy. I would suspect, let me rephrase that, the market won't overreact because They've been telling you all year long what they were going to do. The bad news is they're behind the curve. And now it doesn't seem like they have the courage to go back and say, actually, we need to tighten faster and we're not going to wait till March. I listened to Chairman Powell's press conference the other day. I wish he had announced a rate hike then. Right. I think that would have been the better move, right? He needs to go after it. So, yeah. So uh, two next two questions. Uh, one is about NFTs. I'm going to let you talk about NFTs in just a second, uh, as briefly as you want, or that's up to you. Um, but another question that is um, important important to a lot of our clients is, hey, Ted, we're noticing a lot of cash. I got an email uh, just yesterday from a client. It said, we're noticing a lot of uh, trade confirmations. Is that because of what's going on in the market or whatever? Well, the answer is yes. Um, when we go back and we look at our um, this again some of the positions some of the sleeves if you will and one sleeve that's not on here is a fixed income sleeve um, so those sleeves have been shifting to cash so that particular client that sent me that email yesterday they're already 60 percent in cash and has been 60 percent in cash for a couple of weeks um, and so yet that is the idea of being actively managing it is we don't necessarily want to hold it if the trend is going to continue to go negative so Yes, the high cash that you're seeing in your in your account, that's intentional. You want to talk about NFTs? Yeah, sure. What's the what's the question? Uh, can you address NFTs? Yeah, so NFTs. Um, I think so. When you think about the metaverse, right? This all alternate reality where people will go think about it as a video game, right? Where people will be able to do shopping, working, buy assets, concert venues, right? It's it's going to revolutionize the way that a lot of people experience uh, entertainment, shopping, office work, right, et cetera. And uh, that everything in the metaverse is an NFT, a non-fungible token. Essentially, the way to think about a token is if I tokenize anything, which assume that as we move more towards a digital uh, economy, right, everything will be tokenized ultimately. Companies are being tokenized in what's called decentralized autonomous organizations where governance and ethics is all is all kind of programmed. And then a company exists to carry out its function, right, with very limited influence on a discretionary basis. Non-fungible tokens are the tokenization of any asset. So I can tokenize uh, real estate in the metaverse, for instance, right? That's an NFT. I can go actually in the metaverse in Sandbox or Mana and I can buy quote unquote real estate like shopping malls or office space that people actually use or casinos that people actually use uh, to carry out whatever their functions are. The other thing that we have is, um, you know, a, a, the most common is artwork or content. And so what it is, the tokenization 
of that content. And so when you tokenize, you know, music or art or pretty much anything like that, you use, you do it through a non-fungible token. And then you're able to program that to either pay out a royalty or uh, to not be transferable or to be transferable in shares, but you can kind of program your desire. Now, the ultimate theme of this is, and the beauty of it is it puts the power, right? And the control and the content producer. So the greater theme is this is really awesome. This is part of the grander decentralization trend. And I think that is what is fantastic about non-fungible tokens. But if you want to, you can shoot me an email. Uh, if you uh, shoot Ted an email, I'll get you a paper that we have on NFTs. Really awesome. It's all about the tokenization of assets, which is really the ultimate theme. NFTs and the art are just like the first iterations of this. This is going, real estate will be, uh, tokenized at some point. So I think there's going to be some awesome experiences in the NFT space. We're just getting started. I do not advise owning and holding NFTs necessarily. Uh, I think they're they're trading vehicles just like anything else. And um, it's an exciting new asset class and more to come on that subject. So the next question, I'll take this one. There's speculation and some historic precedent for Republicans um, to take back the um, the Senate, I've lost you, Clint. I, um, there's some speculation, some historic precedent for Republicans to do well in this midterm cycle. If they do take back either the House or the Senate, what does that suggest for the markets? Do markets do well with split government? Well, I, that's uh, something I've studied for a while. The markets actually do do well with split government um, because they can't get anything done. And so when they can't get anything done, then you know we don't we're not changing the rules. So actually would be good i would argue i'm curious to your take but i think it would be good news from the stock market standpoint when we have split government it doesn't matter how it's split but if it's split less gets done there's less changing markets don't like it when things are changing so it's actually uh, good news from that standpoint be interesting to see how that plays out with a inflationary standpoint but um okay is there any economic policy coming out of washington that will impact the economy or the markets i guess that is just a, that's a spending question yeah. No. Yeah. I mean, spending, we, we, we've gone full MMT, modern yes. monetary theory, uh, but you still have taxation. So we haven't really gone full MMT because with MMT taxation makes no sense. So I don't know what we're doing, we're doing both. Um, but yeah, we've gone full MMT. So we're, you know, that's the goal. I don't think much gets done in that light, but we'll see what happens. Yeah. So um, obviously we'll land the plane here in just a minute. If you have any follow-up questions, you reach out to me or any, any of the guys on the team. We'll happy to, happy to answer any of your questions. I think going back to that question about uh, anything coming out of Washington, D.C., you know, historically, when you study the, the United States, we tend to um, increase our spending as we're fighting some crisis. Usually those crises are wars. Um, and then after the war is over, you, you pay down the debt. Um, that trend changed in about 1982. Um, that unfortunately right now our national um, debt to GDP is like 127%. Um, and so we can argue the government should do all kinds of things, but they've got to stop doing some things um, because that's a very dangerous road to be on. Um, Last question, and then we'll, maybe we'll land this. Uh, if you have any feedback, uh, how does this economic back, backdrop impact the real estate market? In real estate market, that goes back to our CPI conversation where the, um, what is it called? Uh, owner occupied yeah. rent is like 4%, yeah. but the reality is home prices are up like 20%. So, I mean, at some point, home prices are gonna correct. When? Yeah. Um, in broader commercial real estate too, if you think about uh, capitalization rates, right? So what you hope is that in inflation, you know, you have cap, you have a cap rate that goes up, which is problematic for real estate pricing. So as cap rates go up, pricing goes down. As cap rates go down, pricing goes up. So real estate prices have really elevated as, as capitalization rates have moved down on commercial real estate. What you'll have happen is uh, hopefully rate uh, rent increases. Uh, outpace capitalization rate increases. And if that happens, then you can keep value somewhat stable. Now, historically, uh, real estate, right, cash flow producing heavy collateral real asset real estate can do okay in, in an inflationary regime, um, right, as a cash flow producing asset. Uh, but again, there's key, the key element there is it's cash flow and you got heavy collateral or heavy asset value there. 
And if you have flexibility on rents, things like that, then it could be okay. So multifamily, industrial, uh, those areas have done, done okay uh, in historic inflation regimes. But again, it's just like everything else. You got to let the market tell you and you know, make your adjustments. Yeah, yeah. Well, Clint, uh, I think unlike last year, we should probably end on time. So uh, it's one o'clock and I think we'll land the plane here. I appreciate you joining us again today, Clint. It's always fun talking to you. Thank you. And uh, yeah, to everybody that's, everybody that's watching, thanks for joining us. If you're not following us on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube, we encourage you to do so. And obviously, if you have any other follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to me or the team. And we are honored to continue to serve you guys. So thanks, everybody, for joining us. Thanks again, Clint. Thanks.